All right, so here we are on Chapter 3, Part 3. When we left off, Eric was learning more about the Korean education system, and he had recently found out that his Korean classmates are going to be in school pretty much all day long. Um, breakfast, lunch, and dinner are all served at the school, um, and then they go to their tutoring sessions until 11 o'clock before finally returning home. So here we go, Iron Child Competition. I met Korea's education minister, Lee Ju Hu, at his office in Seoul. He had a boyish cowlick and a default, default expression of mild amusement, both of which artfully masked the ambition that had powered his career up to this point. So when the author says I, she's talking about herself. So she met Korea's education minister. <clears throat> Lee was a product of the Korean pressure cooker. He had attended an elite high school in Seoul Un National University, one of the country's top three universities. Then he'd earned his Ph.D. in economics at Cornell. He'd risen swiftly up the Korean hierarchy, becoming a professor, then a politician. But when he became the Minister of Education, he did so with the goal of dismantling the pressure cooker, piece by piece. We drank tea around a large table with his entourage of advisors, none of whom spoke, when I asked if he agreed with President Obama's glowing rhetoric about the Korean education system, he smiled a tired smile. It's a question he got asked often, usually by Korean reporters who could not understand what the U.S. president, or anyone, would find to like about Korea's system. You Americans see a bright side of the Korean education system, he said, but Koreans are not happy with it. In some ways, Korea was an extreme manifestation of a very old Asian tradition. Chinese families had been hiring test prep tutors since the 7th century. Civil service exams dated back before, before the printing press. In 10th century Korea, ambitious young men had to pass an exam to get a government job. The high-stakes test was, in practice, accessible only to the sons of the elite, who could afford the ancient version of test prep. Despite the American stereotype that Asians excelled in math and science, regular Koreans were not historically so smart. Confucius may have instilled Koreans with an appreciation for the value of long, careful study, but the country had no history of excelling in math. In fact, the vast majority of its citizens were illiterate as recently as the 1950s. So illiterate, remember, that means that they can't read. So up until the 1950s, a majority of Korea's citizens were illiterate. That's pretty astounding to think that now they're one of the top countries as far as test-taking goes. When the country began rebuilding its schools after the Korean War, the Korean language did not even have words for modern concepts in math and science. New words had to be coined before textbooks could be published. In 1960, Korea had a student-teacher ratio of 59 to 1. That means class sizes of 59 students with one teacher. Holy smokes. Only a third of Korean kids even went to middle school. Poverty predicated academic failure. If PISA had existed back then, the United States would have trounced Korea in every subject. Over the next 50 years, Korea became what Lee called a talent power. The country had no natural resources, so it cultivated its people instead, turning education into currency. <coughs> this period of fren frenetic economic growth created a kind of lottery for Korean parents, if their children got into the best middle schools, which put them on track for the best high schools, which gave them a chance at getting into the top universities, then they would get prestigious, well-paying jobs, which would elevate the entire family. This competition followed very explicit rules. Score above a certain number on the college exam, and you were automatically admitted to a top university. Forever after, you would be paid more than others, even for doing the same work. The system was as predictable as it was brutal. It sent a very clear message to children about what mattered. University admissions were based on student skills as measured by the test. Full stop. Nobody got accepted because he was good at sports or because his parents had gone there. It was, in a way, more merit meritocratic than many U.S. colleges had ever been. Meaning it's based solely on merit. There's nothing else that's taken into consideration. 
it's only your test scores. Imagine a lot of you have already filled out college applications and you've probably seen that. Yes, you have to send your transcript. Yes, you have to put your GPA on there. But more often than not, there's also questions about what else have you done? Have you done volunteer work? What have you been involved in? What clubs have you been involved in? What sports have you played? Have you held a job while working in high school? All those things tend to play a pretty big role in our college application process. Um, it's not the case with Korea. Without this education obsession, South Korea could not have become the economic powerhouse that it was in 2011. Since 1962, the nation's GDP had risen about 40,000%, making it the world's 13th largest economy. Education acted like an anti-poverty vaccine in Korea, rendering family background less and less relevant to kids' life chances over time. But there weren't enough of those university slots or coveted jobs, so the lottery morphed into a kind of iron child competition that parents and kids resented even as they perpetuated it. It was an extreme mediocrity for children that hardened into a caste system for adults. Even when more universities opened, the public continued to fixate on the top three. There was a warning for the rest of the world. Competition had become an end unto itself, not the learning it was supposed to motivate. The country had created a monster, Lee told me. The system had become overly competitive, leading to an unhealthy preoccupation with test scores and a dependence on private tutoring academies. Even over summer break, libraries got so crowded that kids had to get tickets to get a space. Many paid $4 to rent a small air-conditioned corral in the city's plentiful supply of for-profit self-study libraries. Another difference there, right? For-profit self-study libraries... Our libraries are all free, right? They're not making any money off of us. Korea's sky-high PISA scores were mostly a function of students' tireless efforts, Lee believed, not the country's schools. Kids and their families drove the results. Motivation explained Korea's PISA scores more than curriculum, in other words. Per student, Korean taxpayers spent half as much money as American taxpayers on schools, but Korean families made up much of the difference out of their own pockets. In addition to hagwon fees, they had to pay for public school since the government subsidy didn't cover all the expenses. Eric's school was not the most elite public school in Busan, but it still cost about $1,500 per year. On paper, Eric's high schools in Minnesota and Korea had some things in common. Both Minnetonka and Namsan boasted dropout rates of less than 1%, and both schools paid their teachers similarly high salaries. However, while Minnetonka's kids performed in musicals, Namsan's kids studied and studied some more. The problem was not that Korean kids weren't learning enough or working hard enough. It was that they weren't working smart. The iron child culture was contagious. It was hard for kids and parents to resist the pressure to study more and more. But all the while, they complained that the fixation on rankings and test scores was crushing their spirit, depriving them not just of sleep, but of sanity. Collateral damage. One Sunday morning during that school year, a teenager named G stabbed his mother in the neck in their home in Seoul. He did it to stop her from going to a parent-teacher conference. He was terrified that she'd find out that he'd lied about his latest test scores. Afterwards, G kept his secret for eight months. Each day, he came and went to school and back again as if nothing had changed. He told neighbors his mother had left town. To contain the odor of her decomposing body, he sealed the door to her room with glue and tape. He invited friends over for ramen. Finally, his estranged father discovered the corpse, and G was arrested for murder. This ghastly story captivated the country, as might be expected, but for specific and revealing reasons. G's crime was not, in the minds of many Koreans, an isolated tragedy. It was a reflection of a study-crazed culture that was driving children mad. According to his test scores, G ranked in the top 1% of all high school students in the country, but in absolute terms, he still placed 4,000th nationwide. His mother had insisted he must be number one at all costs, G said. 
When his scores had disappointed her in the past, he said, she'd beaten him and withheld food. In response to the story, many Koreans sympathized more, sympathized more with the living son than the dead mother. Commentators projected their own sour memories of high school onto Ji's crime. Some went so far as to accuse the mother of inviting her own murder. A Korea Times editorial described the victim as one of the pushy tiger mothers who are never satisfied with their children's school records, no matter how high their scores. As for Ji, he confessed to police immediately, weeping as he described how his mother had haunted his dreams after he'd killed her. At the trial, the, <coughs> the prosecutor asked for a 15-year prison sentence. The judge, citing mitigating circumstances, sentenced the boy to three and a half years. So, a ton going on in those last few paragraphs. Um, first of all, the whole situation seems crazy out of hand. Um, but then... The author even says that he confessed to police immediately, weeping as he described, but yet he kept her body hidden for eight months. I don't know if immediately is the right word to tell. Yeah, maybe immediately after he was found out, um, but a whole lot happening here and a whole lot of it not right. And three and a half years for murdering your mom? Yikes. Meanwhile, Korean politicians vowed anew to treat the country's education fever, as it was called. Under Lee's tenure, the ministry had hired and trained 500 admissions officers to help the country's universities select applicants the way U.S. universities did, which is to say, based on something other than just test scores. Almost overnight, however, new hagwons cropped up to help students navigate the new alternative admissions scheme, Hundreds of students were accused of lying about their hometowns to get preferential spots reserved for underprivileged rural families. One parent fabricated a divorce to take advantage of a preference for single-parent children. The fever raged on. The country's leaders worried that unless the rigid hierarchy, rigid hierarchy started to nurture more innovation, economic growth would stall and fertility rates would continue to decline as families felt the pressure of paying for all that tutoring. To retroactively improve public schools so that parents would feel less need for hagwons, Lee tried to improve teaching. Korea already had highly educated elementary school teachers relative to the United States and most countries. Korean elementary teachers came from just a dozen universities that admitted the top 5% of applicants, and they were well-trained. Middle school teachers in training in Korea performed at the top of the world on mathematics tests, administered in six countries, trouncing future teachers in the United States. Korea's high school teachers were not as impressive, however. During a shortage of teachers decades earlier, the government had made a fateful mistake, allowing too many colleges to train secondary teachers. Those 350 colleges had lower standards than the elementary training programs. Like the more than 1,000 teacher training colleges in the United States, the Korean programs churned out far more teachers to be than the country needed. Teacher preparation was a lucrative industry for colleges, but the lower standards made the profession less prestigious and less effective. Because, as one Korean policymaker famously said, the quality of an education system cannot exceed the quality of its teachers. What do you think about that? The quality of an education system cannot exceed the quality of its teachers. So your system can only be as good as your teachers who are running it. To elevate the profession, Lee rolled out a new teacher evaluation scheme to give teachers useful feedback and hold them accountable for results. Under the new system, teachers were evaluated in part by their own students and their parents who filled out online surveys, as well as other teachers, an approach meant to approximate the 360-degree re review used in many businesses. Unlike the model used by many U.S. districts, Korea's teacher evaluation scheme did not include student test score growth, Officials I talked to seemed to want to use this data, but they didn't know how to assign accountability since so many students had multiple teachers, including outside tutors, instructing them in the same subjects. Under Korea's new rules, low-scoring teachers were supposed to be retrained, but as in U.S. districts where reform reformers have tried imposing similar strategies, teachers and their unions fought back, calling it an unfair, pretty policies on paper turned toxic in practice, 